honor of having, have the honor of hearing from Professor Yossi Chayes. Professor Chayes is the Wolfson Professor of Jewish Thought in the Department of Jewish History at the University of Haifa. Yossi's research focuses on the intersection of Kabbalah, magic, and science in Jewish cultural history, which resulted in a book and many articles. For the past decade, he has studied and directed the Ilanot Project, which received grants from many foundations like the Israel Science Foundation and the Volkswagen Foundation, and resulted in a fascinating and important website called Maps of God that I encourage you to go and take a look. The talk today will focus on the Ilanot Project and especially the HC manuscripts that are included in the project. Please welcome Professor Yossi Chayes. It's mute. Ask him to. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you, Yoram. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not, uh, even after a semester of teaching on this thing, haven't got it down with uh, quite the panache you might want. So thank you, uh, Yoram. Thank you uh, to Abigail and the HUC, JIR, Cloud Library uh, staff who have been so helpful to me uh, on so many occasions over the last decade. Um, so it was, my pleasure and really the least I could do uh, to respond positively to the suggestion that I give a lecture this evening that showcased some of the extraordinary artifacts in the Clow Library in Cincinnati, um, which I, I hope to get back to in the flesh before too long. Um, in, the, in the meantime, again, between uh, all the wonderful people there who've uh, cooperated with each other and with me. I have some great images. I'm going to share them with you and do uh, something like a virtual show and tell this evening. Um, and uh, since it's not really a long lecture and it's not really a simple subject, I will have to jump right in. I, I do want to just, uh, there's, Enough, there are a lot of people on this Zoom screen that I want to say hi to, uh, maybe at the end. And I'm so happy to see some faces that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, one person has to be given a special shout out any anytime I open my mouth on this subject, and that is William Gross. Uh, William has joined us from his bunker in Tel Aviv. <laughs> William is the uh, the visionary godfather of the Ilanot project, the man who 40 years ago began collecting Ilanot before anyone knew what they were. It sounds like a crazy thing to say, but William has a, a famous eye for interesting objects uh, in the, the Jewish cultural experience, spotted Ilanot and began collecting them only to discover that no scholars of Kabbalah could tell him what they were. That no scholar of Kabbalah had written a book about them, an article about them, an entry in the Encyclopedia Judaica about them, a genre that was created that emerged in the 14th century with 600 years of artifacts that had gone completely unstudied and, and unappreciated until he noticed it and started turning over rocks until he found me under <laughs> one of the last ones, undoubtedly. And uh, it's really been um, a fantastic ride ever since. Uh, and to the best of my ability in the 45 minutes that I've been given minus the five I've just spent uh, 
acknowledging and celebrating William, whose birthday is tomorrow. So happy birthday. In just a few hours, keep up the good work. Keep having birthdays. A lot of folks need you around for many years to come. So, um, and I should just say one last thing by way of introduction. Uh, a book that began as a, as a catalog of William's unparalleled collection of Ila Note and very naturally developed into a history of the genre is, uh, is nearly complete. It's been accepted by the Lippmann Library of Jewish Civilization and will be published uh, in a large format, kind of coffee table style edition, hopefully uh, by the beginning of 2022. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, it still is a catalog of William's collection, but it is also um, a history of the genre. And that is a good lead in to the lecture. Can you all see my shared screen? It has uh, the HUC promotional brochure on it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, where does the Clow Library come into all of this? Well, it, the Clow Library doesn't have a lot of Ela Note. I've been uh, I've been hoping that somebody would go into a, a drawer and a in a vault somewhere in Cincinnati and find a few more, but I can't really complain because the three that are in Cincinnati are without exception important artifacts, critical to my work, critical to research, critical to the history of Ila Note. And um, my mission for this evening is to tell you enough about Ila Note to enable you to appreciate these three Ela Note in the Cloud Library's collection, so um, I'm going to I'm going to try. Uh, so let's see, Ray. I got to go back to hold on. I got to get myself to the right place here. Okay, so that you don't need to see. This is tonight's lecture. There are two parts and actually two separate. Uh, uh, video, well, they're not videos, but they're called prezies. They're kind of uh, uh, nonlinear PowerPoint presentations that I'll be showing back to back. Um, basically, because I'll be the three Ila Note are in two different Kabbalistic worlds. Uh, I hope that some of you, if not all of you, have at least a little background in Kabbalah so that this is not going to go too far over, over your heads. Just uh, asking for your, your, your compassion here. Imagine that you tuned in for a lecture on Euclidean diagrams, but never studied geometry. These are, these are maps of a world that it's very helpful to know some Kabbalah to appreciate. Um, the, the first artifact that I will speak about tonight is one that I named the Magnificent Parchment as a kind of an homage to the Medici family uh, that uh, sought to acquire one of these things 300 years ago. And, uh, and the magnificent parchment belongs to the world of classical Kabbalah. Classical Kabbalah, the, uh, the Kabbalah of ten spherot, the ten spherot, uh, the ten luminous emanations, the ten qualities, attributes of the divine that are the characteristic feature of, of Kabbalistic thought uh, over the last 800 years. So uh, that's the first Ilan. Ilan, by the way, uh, means tree in Hebrew, and these are Kabbalistic trees. But Ilan also is the word used for the genre itself, which was defined as early as the 16th century very clearly as uh, the wedding of parchment sheet and an arboreal diagram. So the classical Kabbalistic Ilan is an Ilan that presents the ten spherot in their in their uh, uh, definitive array. 
And the two other ELA note that I'll speak about in the second half of the presentation are part of the world of Lurianic Kabbalah, the 16th century revolution in Kabbalistic thought that was something like, uh, I could say, as Einstein is to Newton, so is Luria to the classical Kabbalah. Things get more complicated. Ilanot have to be reinvented. The genre has to be re reinvented to cope with the in new approach of the Lurianic system. Uh, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me take you into the world of the magnificent parchment for uh, the next 10 minutes or so. Um, OK, so what you're seeing now is one of the earliest Ilanot that have reached us. This is a parchment. You can just barely make out the tape measures that run its length and, and width. Uh, it's one sheet of, of parchment that's been cut in a way that still preserves something of the natural contours of the animal from which it was borrowed. Uh, and Yossi, yes. Sorry, can you share it with us? Oh, you should be seeing my screen. You're not no. seeing my. You're not seeing my screen. No. Okay. Um, this whole time, I thought that you were seeing my screen. So, let me see. Now, I, I was uh, under the false assumption that you could see it. How uh, about now? Yes. Now, yes. Thank you. Okay. So this is in the Vatican Library. Uh, Vatican has great stuff. And uh, the Elanote Project actually has a collaboration agreement with the Vatican. Uh, and we'll be putting out uh, some editions of their visual Kabbalistic manuscripts beginning later this year. But this is one of the earliest Kabbalistic Elanote on parchment. And Basically, what you see is what you get. This is the, it's a 15th century artifact. Um, you can see it has uh, the 10 Sfirot. The, each one has the name. This one is Chokhmah, Wisdom, one of the higher Sfirot. A Gedula, Greatness, another name for Chesed or Love. Um, and what is sort of characteristic of these very basic early artifacts is that they take an introduction to Kabbalah, which basically means an introduction to the Sfirot, and they fragment, you could say they fragment what would otherwise be a linear introduction into its component pieces, each of the 10 Sfirot, and inscribe the qualities and attributes and, and different names uh, associated with, with each of them in their right place on the map. So uh, this is uh, what you're seeing. And this is the kind of Elan 1.0. 1, 1. Uh, now, I have to move rather quickly with apologies, but the next Elan that uh, you can see here, why is it? I want to make sure it's a full screen. Yeah, ah, no, that wasn't the right way to do it, apparently. OK, so now maybe it's a little better. Sorry about this uh, rehashing. The, the large greenish uh, parchment you see on your screen is the magnificent parchment that is in Cincinnati at the Clow Library. And the magnificent parchment is, this is a big leap. I just showed you Vatican manus, Hebrew manuscript 530. It may be the earliest of the Ilanot from the middle of the 15th century. Not that there, there, there were earlier ones, but they haven't reached us. And now I'm showing you an Ilan that was probably produced around 1500. It seems to be the oldest witness, as we say in the business. It's the oldest copy of this manuscript 
family. By family, we mean uh, a group of related manuscripts. And in this case, uh, you could just say it's, like I said, it's the earliest copy of a manuscript that has reached us in about a dozen different copies. All indications are that the copy in Cincinnati is the oldest one in the world today. Uh, it's also one of the most deteriorated. So it's quite difficult to read and quite difficult to, uh, to use as we make a critical edition. Uh, but of course, a close up, we're gonna zoom in. I want you to see how it works. Just, you know, uh, the bird's eye view is, if you can't tell, the 10 spherot, the three are, the three upper spherot are arranged as a, as a tower. That's a, a very Italian uh, choice. They like to array the three top spherot without using right or left because they believe that the three highest spherot were beyond right and left. So, but still the 10 spherot on top of a zodiac rota. Let's zoom in and look more closely at this. These are the top two spherot. And where did the spherot come from? Where are these divine attributes? Where does this revealed God emanate from? It emanates from Ein Sof, which is the Hebrew word for no end or the infinite or Meister Eckhart's no thing. In the magnificent parchments, at least most of them, uh, Ein Sof is represented as an eye. You can see that here. When I show you some better preserved copies in a moment, you'll be able to see everything better than you see it now. But I really want you to see this oldest of the extant copies. So it's an eye. If you look closely in the uh, Sphira of Keter, there is a kind of Renaissance fountain that is uh, that is uh, uh, <laughs> pouring water out, and the water is the shefa, it's the divine abundance that's flowing through this whole system, like a kind of divine hydraulic system. And you can see it's pouring into chokhmah, wisdom, and the watery motif continues all the way through the spherotic tree. We're now going already down to Netzach, Hod, Yisod, and Malchut, the lowest spherot, just to give you a sense also of the artistry, and I'll say more about this in a moment, the dragon that is uh, clinging to this uh, lower sphera of Malchut shows you uh, that the side of evil is always interested in uh, feeding as it as it's able to off of the side of holiness. And this is just one example of, a, of, a, of a, an alternate spherotic tree that has been incorporated into the background of this incredible parchment. I should say, by the way, you may have noticed that there is a lot of text in the magnificent parchment. How much? About 33,000 words. And that text is an anthology of materials that were on the bookshelf of Italian Kabbalists in the second half of the 15th century. It's a lot of Abraham Abu Lafia. Um, and uh, there's Gikatila and there's uh, there are philis philis more philosophical sources incorporated as well. Um, but this is a kind of a presi of the Italian Kabbalists library of its day. I'm now showing you the Zodiac at the bottom uh, because the magnificent parchment is trying to give a, a complete uh, an inclusive map of the cosmos. It's representing the divine world and at least from a bird's eye view, the created universe, the celestial spheres um, and uh, everything basically down to the planet earth and the Ptolemaic concentric circle schema that was in place until the Copernican uh, geocentric revolution and stayed 
in place for many Jews for a long time to come after Copernicus. Um, a few fascinating features. At the, uh, atop the celestial spheres, there's a representation of the four chariot beasts, the Chayot, HaKodesh, the Chayot, HaMerkava, the chariot beasts of Ezekiel 1. Standing among them is Rabbi Akiva. I'll show you more about that in a second. This is uh, an angel carrying the crown of the Torah. This is very difficult to see. You'll see it better momentarily, but these, this is a representation of the four sages who entered the Pardes from the Babylonian Talmud at Tractate Chagiga, only one of whom entered in peace and exited in peace, Rabbi Akiva. I'll show you that in a second. Now you can take a deep breath. You've seen the incredible historic Cincinnati witness of this manuscript. Now you're seeing the copy that's held today in the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. Um, let's have a, and just to give you a little more of a tour, this is a copy made in the middle of the 16th century by a, an itinerant Polish Kabbalist named David Darshan that is in the British Library. And this one is the only one that has reached us that actually has a colophon signed by the scribe responsible for it, in which he says, the Polish itinerant Kabbalist says, I was in Modena in, in the 1550s and saw this incredible Ilan and made a copy of it. And here it is. You can see it's executed in a, without all of the colors and the gold leaf that we see in other copies, but it's still uh, an extraordinary parchment. One thing that is uh, very special about it is that David Darshan was himself a very serious Kabbalist. So he didn't make errors that we find occasionally in copies that were made by wonderful scribes, but not very knowledgeable Kabbalists. Um, okay, so I showed you that. Um, this is an incredible fragment that's in the library in Leeds, at the University in Leeds, uh, that was left incomplete. From it, we can see the magnificent parchment in progress. This, we get a sense of how the scribe worked, creating the basic outlines and then filling them in piece by piece. So it's quite uh, fascinating just in that respect. Now, some of the things I showed you in the Cincinnati magnificent parchment, I'll show you in Oxford so you can see them better. First of all, the eye. And uh, I guess you saw under the eye that lovely Renaissance piazza fountain. The word here inscribed on it is Mayan. It's a fountain, a spring. Um, uh, just to bring to your attention that the magnificent parchment does not only anthologize texts that were on the Italian Kabbalists bookshelf, but also some of the iconography that was in the Kabbalistic works of, its, of, his, of his time, of its time, and especially one work that has reached us in, in about a half dozen uh, copies from the same period that I call the Kuntras Hatsurot HaKabaliot, the booklet of Kabbalistic forms. It's like a Kabbalistic emblem book in which each page opens with a diagram of the Sfirot and a different uh, schema, and then explains what that representation of the Sfirot is meant to express. So this, for example, is a, is a configuration of the Sfirot that's very different uh, to one we're familiar with, the arboreal schema. And this is meant to represent the Garden of Eden in the form of the Sfirot. And here it is as, uh, as it appears in the emblem book that is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. I showed you this a moment ago on the Cincinnati exemplar. This is a rare arboreal representation of the Sfirot that includes some botanical features. The branches of the Sfirotic tree have been given leaves. This too is in that same booklet of Kabbalistic forms. 
And now just very broadly to show you, uh, again, the, the magnificent parchment has the tree of Spherot on top, and it has the, the zodiac, which represents the created worlds, the created world uh, beneath. Let's take a somewhat closer look. And the Oxford copy, which is, uh, which is a bit different than uh, the Cincinnati copy, the, uh, we see the iconography of the of the zodiac constellations, the, the mazalot, the different signs of the zodiac, um, and astrologically oriented uh, information embedded in the zodiac circles. Now a clearer picture of the four sages who uh, are about to enter Pardes here, understood as embarking on a, on, a, on a journey that will take them into the Kabbalistic uh, visualization of the divine realm. The Pardes becomes the tree, of, the tree of Sfirot, as we'll see in just a moment. Rabbi Akiva is probably this gentleman here leading the pack. He has to pass through these six realms, these six hechalot. Now you can see the keter, the crown of Torah, keter atihilot, carried by Sandalfon, the angel. Rabbi Kiva will be using that uh, crown of the Torah to pass through all of these levels of the heavens. They literally are the heavens that are beyond the planetary spheres and the intellects until he arrives at the top of the spheres where the heavens meet the heaven of heavens. The Shemaim gives way to the Shmei HaShemaim, as in Ezekiel 1, the sky opened up and I saw the, the Chayot, I saw the Kruvim, the cherubs. And these are the cherubs with the human face, the lion face, the bull face and the eagle face. Rabbi Akiva is among them because he's made it there. And from there, he can see what every intrepid voyager into the heavenly world is, is trying to see, and that is God, just like Ezekiel in chapter one. So what is just above him, above the cherubs, the kruvim, is the rakia, the firmament, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just break out your Bibles and open to Ezekiel chapter 1. And on top of the firmament, the throne of glory. It's a Renaissance kind of throne chair uh, inscribed, Dmut Kisei, the image of the throne. The philosophically oriented Italian Kabbalists, or Kabbalist re who was responsible for this, but it's very characteristic of Italian Kabbalists in this period, uh, were concerned about uh, corpore corporealizing the divine. So they'll use this kind of terminology. It's the image of the throne. Don't, be, don't think that there's a, a chair up there in, in the heavens. But there's a, this image that Ezekiel saw, Rabbi Akiva saw, and it's over the heads of the chariot beasts. In Ezekiel 1, who's sitting on the throne? Well, if you open to Ezekiel 1, you'll see it's, it's God portrayed in the most anthropomorphic way you find in the Hebrew Bible. But the, for the Kabbalists, the vision of God, the structure of God, the picture of God is the spherotic tree. So nested in, parked atop, seated atop the throne of glory is the tree of the spherot. That is the magnificent parchment. And with that, I've concluded the first half of my lecture. I hope I haven't used too much more than half of my allotted time. But let me see now. I have to get out of this and into number two, which is here. Are you still able to see my new screen? Now it should say Ilanot 2.0. It's 
Good. Okay, I'm seeing some thumb, thumbs up. I'm working with two screens, which is why I'm not looking into the camera. I need to look at my second screen. I apologize for that sort of strange antisocial gaze, non-gaze. Okay, we're in the world of Luriana Kabbalah. I can't explain what Luriana Kabbalah is to you um, in 60 seconds or less, but in the 16th century, here in Tzfat, a uh, rabbi who had spent many years in isolation on an island uh, on the Nile, studying the Zohar, uh, became a revered teacher for about a year and a half uh, until he died in a plague in 1572. Uh, his primary disciple was a man named Chaim Vital, who was from uh, Calabria. So this, uh, this Ilanot uh, field, I should say, is a primarily an Italian affair, especially when, when, when I feel like I need to go to Italy, it becomes a very Italian affair. But uh, so Chaim Calabrese was the main disciple of Luria. And I can just say on one foot that in that uh, Einsteinian to Newtonian leap that Luria created a kind of uh, dynamic system that was very much inspired by uh, the Zohar and particularly uh, the section of the Zohar known as the Idrot, um, the, um, the threshing floor of the Zohar. Doesn't, doesn't name doesn't mean so much, but the, the, the most mysterious and profound section of the Zohar uh, in, one, in one of those uh, Idrot, Shimon Bar Yochai, the rabbi uh, who's most associated with the Zohar uh, in its literary expression, uh, dies at the end because it's uh, it's too much. There's no there's no coming back from there. But uh, uh, I'll show you on the on the manuscripts themselves a sort of a picture of this new Kabbalistic system. Maybe it's better than trying to explain it uh, without the pictures. So let's let's dive in. Uh, from the very beginning, in the late 16th century, Luriana Kabbalists, so at that time, they were just basically the people who studied with Luria and primarily Vital himself, they're making diagrams and using diagrams just to try and uh, visualize this complicated system that Luria has taught. Um, so in, in a typical uh, Lurianic cosmogonic treatise, you'll find at the beginning a discussion of the very first stages of creation, uh, the, emanation, the emanatory creation. Many of you will have heard this, uh, this story of how God had to create the infinite, the Ein Sof uh, needed to create space so that creation could even come into being. So space was vacated. That's called the Tzim Tzum, the withdrawal of the divine of the infinite from some place that the Kabbalists were uh, sure must have been a sphere because the sphere is perfect. And into this sphere, emanation began in the form of uh, spheres of light. These uh, spherical uh, orbs of light are the earliest expressions of the spherot. Um, Luria and Vital said, we can't really even talk about them. They're too high. But what can we talk about? We can talk about a channel, a vertical channel that was subsequently shot into that sphere and became something with an up and a down and began to suggest what we will eventually know as space um, and uh, three-dimensionality. And that uh, incursion of verticality into this sphere is called in Luriana Kabbalah, the primordial Adam, Adam Kadmon. And Adam Kadmon, the primordial Adam is basically, um, you know, the, the first God that the Luriana Kabbalist is willing to talk about. And you see it here in this very simple diagram the vertical shaft is inscribed primordial atom. The 
10 circles of the primordial spherot aren't even inscribed here. But when Chaim Vital was working on his manuscripts, mostly in the decades after his teacher died, only after only a year and a half of study, he significantly ramified that diagram called Igulim Viyosher, circles and linearity, or spheres and linearity. Um, this is a, a wonderful example of one of Vital's more complex representations of this structure of the, uh, of the divine world, according to Luria's teachings. And uh, what's also fascinating about this is that uh, it comes from a manuscript. This is a copy of a manuscript that Vital, in a kind of Kafkaesque way, buried in a Geniza that was exhumed and brought to a Portuguese converso Kabbalist in the 16, around 1640 in Jerusalem. And he restored these manuscripts. And in, in this uh, manuscript, this is a copy of it, that Kabbalist who name, whose name was Yaakov Tzemach, Jacob Tzemach, wrote, this is the drawing that I found in Vital's manuscript, in Vital's autograph manuscript. And then ne he, then he made a, another drawing next to it. And he said, and this is my own version of it based on the same teachings that are visualized in Vital's own diagram. The only other thing I want you to know about the early Lurianic diagrams is that we have a number of a number of uh, accounts according to which Vital opened his personal original copy of the work known as the Tree of Life, Etz Chaim, or the Tree of Chaim, with a very large diagram called the Dafa Metsuyar or the Dafa Tziur, the, the drawn page. And uh, this was seen by many Kabbalists of the era and was undoubtedly a contributing uh, factor to the emergence of the Lurianic Ilan. And even what we're seeing here, especially on the left side, may represent a kind of miniaturization of that, uh, that fold-out diagram that opened Chaim Vital's own manuscript. Uh, later copies of Lurianic works uh, that are uh, very similar to uh, in content to Vital's manuscript that I've just mentioned, also open with fold-out diagrams. Here you're seeing the fold-out that opens uh, a comparable treatise that's in the Bodleian in Oxford. And here you're seeing a fold-out that opens Etz Chaim, the, pop, the Mayor Popper's redaction of Etz Chaim that's in the Prague Museum. So this became a, a a, a, a kind of customary practice among Luriana Kabbalists to, to open these cosmological treatises with large maps, dynamic maps of the emanatory scheme that are detailed uh, throughout, throughout uh, the books that they, that they introduce. Okay, um, this is just a short passage that we find in uh, Jacob Tzemach's uh, one of Jacob Tzemach's books in which he mentions having pioneered the creation of a new kind of Ilan that would show the, uh, in the interfaces between the different divine personae or partsufim uh, that were central to the Lurianic emanation system. Instead of thinking about emanation in the classical way, there's Ein Sof, the infinite, and Ten Sfirot. Uh, the Lurianic system began with that primordial atom, but from there um, began, um, began um, mapping out a whole network through which the divine light had to flow as it made its way uh, down to the lower levels of creation. And these divine personae, our partsufim, 
enrobe in one another. So higher levels nest or uh, link to cognate levels in lower, uh, lower down in the structure. This was Tzemach's innovation. And now I'm going to show you what it looks like and stop talking so much. Um, my, and what, just one more stop, and that is in these Lurianic new Ilanot emerge between roughly 1630 and 1650. And we see in that middle of the 17th century quite a, f a few ways of mapping the Lurianic system. I call these single origin Lurianic Ilanot, like, uh, like you find now in chocolates or single malt whiskeys. These are not blended. These are not compounded. These are unique expressions of, uh, or unique visualizations of the Lurianic system, or at least one aspect of it. Uh, and there were, you know, let's say five that were quite dominant. And this is important because from, from the end of the 17th century, you almost never see these on their own anymore because these became the building blocks of the Lurianic trees, the Lurianic Ilanot of the 18th and 19th centuries. They are almost without exception compound artifacts that use these single origin Ilanot as as components. These are the Legos that they use to build their Ilanot. And the Ilanot, the Lurianic Ilanot and the Clau collection are of this kind, compound Ilanot that I call uh, in my uh, forthcoming book the, on the Kabbalistic tree, uh, great trees. I use the term great tree to refer to a Lurianic Ilan that is compounded of two or, mo two or more modules. And the central modules are those that I believe can be with reasonable certainty um, associated with Mayor Poppers, the man responsible for Etz Chaim, the canonical work of Luriana Kabbalah, and Yaakov Tzemach, uh, who was in fact his teacher, that Portuguese born a converso who at the age of 35, age of 35 left Portugal and uh, made his way to uh, Tzfat. So let me show you a bit. This is an example of a single origin. I believe it is uh, a, good, uh, a good representation of the innovation of Tzemach. You can see here each of these divine personae, which are called Abba, Ima, mother, father, or father, mother, um, uh, Yaakov, Rachel, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, um, and some more mysterious names too, like Arich Anpin and Ze'er Anpin, the long face and the short face, or the long-suffering, patient and impatient, Arich Anpin, Ze'er Anpin. These are the divine personae that are, this is that, more complex system, and they are nesting, or in the Kabbalistic, uh, using the Kabbalistic terminology, they are enrobing in one another. These are called the hitlab shuyot, hit, from lehitlabesh means to get dressed in Hebrew. So one partzuf or persona becomes dressed in another, as they say, like you, like the soul becomes enrobed by the body. So the higher levels of the divine become enrobed in the lower levels, but knowing how they interface and intersect with each other is key to understanding the system. And you can't, un you can't use the system. You can't practice Lurianic Kabbalah. You can't enact the tikkun, the reparation, or the enhancement of the divine if you don't know how this system works. So th this is a, uh, 
a, a, a kind of shorthand uh, precis of the basic structure of this system as, as it works. Uh, what I'm showing you now is difficult to appreciate as an anthropomorphic representation, but I'm now showing you a second single origin Ilan. This one was, uh, this one was drafted by quite a famous uh, Kabbalist, uh, Beryl Perlhefter. And it is a, a copy of the Ilan innovated by Poppers, the student of Zemach. Poppers made two major contributions to the genre about maybe only 15 years or so after his teacher had made the first uh, innovatory move in, in uh, re reviving the genre. Poppers uh, made a picture of Adam Kadmon. Nobody ever tried that before. And this is the face, the head of Adam Kadmon, which is described at great length in the Lurianic cosmogonic treatises, not because they're interested in uh, whether the primordial atom was handsome or not, but because each of the openings in the head of Adam Kadmon, the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, the ears, were light streams that were that were streaming different kinds of light that were critical to the very first phases of creation. Uh, so you're, this is a picture of the, the face of Adam Kadmon. In some representations, I'll show you very, very soon, uh, it will be more representationally uh, presented. But even here, you may see, those of you who know Hebrew, it says here, right ear, left ear, nose of Adam Kadmon, Chotam de Adam Kadmon, Metzach de Adam Kadmon, the forehead of Adam Kadmon also was streaming with light. Pe de Adam Kadmon, the mouth of Adam Kadmon and so forth. The second innovation of Poppers was to present much more detailed tables of the enrobing process that Semach had shown schematically. And that's what you see. This is uh, this is now Arichanpin, the long-suffering uh, persona of God that uh, is the first expression of the divine after Adam Kadmon. Um, going all the way down here um, to, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a better sense of it in, a, in just a moment. These are now compound Ilanot, or what I call great trees. Let's just quickly look at it two next to each other, and then I'll show you the Cincinnati manuscripts. On the left, a Cambridge manuscript that's done by a great scribe who was probably not the world's greatest Kabbalist, judging from some of the howlers uh, in the Hebrew, but not too bad. The right one is a scroll that took me years to obtain uh, that is in the library of 770 in Crown Heights, New York, given to the Frida Gerebe as a gift by one of his Hasidim. Um, and it's quite extraordinary. But what I'm going to show you are two, these are two of the, of the uh, most fundamental compound Ilanot or great trees. They both begin with the section associated with poppers. That's the head of Adam Kadmon and the head of Arichan Pin. You see it quite uh, amazingly represented here in the Cambridge with the nostrils and the eyes and the ears. You don't have to guess. Even the 770 Chabad Ilan is quite representational. If you can see it better now, the ears, the eyes, the nose and so forth are very uh, representationally rendered. Uh, then, they, then they do two different things. This is just a great example of how compound Ilano work. They both contain the same two modules, but rather than simply connect them one after the other, well, that's what the Chabad Ilan does. The Chabad takes the popper single origin and then sews it on top of the Tzemach single origin. This is, a, this is too much for me to get into right now, but there's a certain uh, redundancy that's inevitable in that kind of a presentation. To, to, to minimize that redundancy, the, uh, 
we have a different type of great tree on the left in which they have spliced semach into poppers. So this is poppers. Then semach is already going on here. This you can see the this is what you know you see this and you you right away know okay that's semach. Whereas over in the Chabad one you're getting all kinds of crazy super detailed ta uh, tables that present the enrobing in its uh, all its gory details. You get to the bottom of the Chabad one, and uh, it ends in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem on high. And, and then Tzemach begins. You can see Tzemach gets started over here. It's much harder to see it. But Tzemach gets going, and then Tzemach continues. Whereas in the Cambridge, after we did Tzemach, we went back to Poppers, and we end in Jerusalem. And here, this is quite extraordinary. The uh, very talented scribe responsible for this has, uh, has made a, a, a fantastic copy of an engraving um, of Jerusalem from that period. Uh, as you can imagine, there's much more to say. These are the two faces. Just giving you a quick rehash. And now to Clow Scrolls 69. I'm still getting used to the new names. Um, how, that five more minutes, Avigail, five, <laughs> okay. Um, we also want to have time for a few questions. So. Yes, I, okay, my, all right. So the Clow Scroll 69 is the oldest, and mm, it's the oldest compound Elan that features an opening that became very popular subsequently and was in fact included in the first uh, Lurianic compound uh, uh, Ilan or great tree ever printed in 1864 in Warsaw. This is a, a fantastic story. Every Ilan has a, a fantastic story behind it. My book on Ilanot is a book of stories, the stories of each one. What's the story uh, in a nutshell of this? You'll never believe it, and I probably don't have time to tell it to you anyway. But in 1677, a Christian Kabbalist in Sulzbach, Germany, named Christian Knorr von Rosenroth collected Kabbalistic Ilanot and had a very fine engraver prepare in engravings of these uh, Ilanot. He found Semach, he found Poppers, but he did not find an Ilan that visualized the cosmogonic doctrine of uh, another pupil of Luria's who was very popular at that time in Europe by the name of Israel Saruk. And Knorr had discovered Saruk's teaching in a book published in 1648 called The Valley of the King, Emeka Melech, decided he was gonna just visualize it himself. And he created a series of diagrams to include in his presentation of Ilanot in his Latin book, Kabbalah de Nudata. And these are figures eight through 11 that I've put on this table. These are from Knorr's Latin treatise. These found their way first, well, let's just say this, the first Jewish Lurianic Ilan that contains the visualizations of Saruk's Lurianic cosmogony is Clow Library Scroll 69. And this is very easy to see, uh, especially if you have any uh, kind of uh, Sherlock Holmesian sensibilities and look, look for the insignificant details and realize that of all the Ilanot out there, there is nothing that compares to the, the fidelity of Clow Scroll 69 to the engravings in Knorr's Kabbalah de Nudata. The Jews who subsequently copied this material didn't even really understand what they were copying most of the time. So, I want to. I won't 
maybe I don't want to push that point too far, but there are certainly things that they didn't get and details that they eliminated because they didn't know what they were doing there. Uh, but you have here this incredible moment in Kabbalistic history where Christian Kabbalah and Jewish Kabbalah cross over. And from there, the Klau 69 goes to its presentation of Popper's head of Adam Kadmon following the model that we saw, the same model as the Cambridge manuscript, the heads of Adam Kadmon and Ari Pin, followed by Tzemach, and thereafter resuming Poppers to the end. Another extraordinary and, and unusual feature of this very old uh, compound Ilan is that it has a colophon. It's very rare to find a colophon in a, on an Ilan. Klaus 69 has it, uh, and it was uh, an, an otherwise unknown Kabbalist by the name of Isaac of Gruppe, who was uh, responsible for making it. It's quite a lovely colophon in a poetic Hebrew that he's written expressing, well, I'll just read, Asiti zot lo mipnei gaon v'ga'ava, ki lo le'enaim hi ta'ava, rak mikvod Hashem shochen shchakim, l'ilmod bo sodotav ha'amukim, ve'et brit yitzchak iti yakim. Oh, so nice. I know not everybody knows Hebrew. So that was my moment to inspire you to learn Hebrew. <laughs> no, it just means I didn't do this because it's pretty. I did it because it's so meaningful and so deep. Okay. Last, the last, the third Ilan in the Cloud Library that I have to give you at least a minute about is also quite an extraordinary Ilan. It is one of three copies that have reached us uh, of this very unique family, which I call, you can I, I, because I got to be the first one in the field, I get to name everything. Like, you know, I feel like Adam in the Garden of Eden. So this I call the Ilan of Holiness, the Ilan Shalakadusha, and you'll see in a moment why I chose this name. But this also is a component Ilan, but it, uh, unlike most of the other great trees, he's not playing with Legos. This guy, Everything he uses, he reinvents, he re-envisions, he reimagines. And his texts engage with his diagrams. He has a lot to say, and nothing, nothing is just cut and pasted here. He also was very influenced by a, uh, a book devoted to the Sur, uh, Saruk school of Luriana Kabbalah. Um, whoever designed this originally. And this first section sets out a material that's parallel to uh, the Knorr von Rosenroth section of Klau Scrolls 69. So that's what you're seeing on top. Here is a, uh, the same section in the copy that's in the uh, collection of William Gross, who's with us this evening. Um, and uh, I don't want to, I've said that the two other Clow Library scrolls are right, like number one in their fields. If I'm perfectly honest, in this case, the Bill, the William Gross Tree of Holiness is number one, and Clow is going to have to take number two. There's some reasons for that, but um, who, the, the person who made the 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 copy that's in the Gross family collection really knew what he was doing. He wasn't a great scribe. He wasn't, the, he wasn't God's gift to sc scribal art. But everything is in its right place and he's not making stupid mistakes. And he's, he, he knows what he's doing. So this is the same section. This is maybe my favorite diagram uh, in this Ilan showing an amazing Sarukian concept, visualizing this amazing Sarukian concept that according to Saruk, God withdrew, the Ein Sof withdrew and created this vacuum. But then instead of just pouring the Sfirot right into it, Saruk described a, a, a kind of ongoing uh, series of incursions 
of the light of the infinite into the vacated sphere. But each time it would go in, it would pull out. So it was going in and out and in and out. But each time it went in, it left a point. These are called the nitukin, the, the, uh, the withdrawal points, harishimot, the nitukin, the impressions of, the, of, the with, of these withdrawals. Now, and this is where it gets so cool. So the middle of the diagram are these points of light. What happens to these points of light? Why are they important to the cosmogonic story? Well, they're important because there's a kind of centrifugal process that takes place in this primordial sphere in which these points begin to aggregate to create the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which you can see forming here around in the inner uh, circumference of the circle. So that's just, that's awesome. I can't think of a better word to describe it. Now, here's where you have to agree with me that the Clown Manuscript is nice, but that's, well, one second. I did. This is another beauty. A, a, later in the narrative, this, this poor orphaned letter Yud that has to penetrate through these primordial spherot to fertilize the rest of creation. And this is kind of a cool image too. You can see the, 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 the spheres being uh, penetrated by this, by this Yud. It's all very nice. Let's check out Klau. This is the Rishimota Nitukin of, of Klau. Seems like the scribe didn't have so much patience for this one. Although it generally you can see his writing is very nice, very clear. But he, he wasn't going to waste his time with, uh, with the letters and everything. So, OK. His, uh, he also did a, a very schemat schematic uh, a ruler and compass assisted version of that Yud penetrating the spheres at the bottom of the section. Afterwards, quite distinctive images of Adam Kadmon and Ari Pin, inspired by poppers. Here you can see Adam Kadmon, and, uh, and you can see actually in the crown, Ilan Shalak uh, So that's how it got the name, the Tree of Holiness. Beneath uh, a somewhat uh, intense image of the face of Arich Anpin, the, uh, the, really the highest of, of the divine personae, or part Sufim. There he is in the gross exemplar. Uh, the Tzemach, pa a part of uh, Klaus 69. Uh, and then this other quite fascinating section that's not in uh, most compound Ilanot. These uh, medallions are in, uh, in the poppers, typical poppers Ilan. They're called the Pirkei Hatzelem, the, uh, like the, the these are the, the kind of an interface between uh, uh, Zer Anpin, the lower, the lower expression of divinity and the, and the worlds beneath. But, uh, but what I'm primarily referring to here is this uh, very old fashioned looking tree of Sfirot uh, and, uh, and these hands. Uh, these are not chiromantic hands, but um, the hands that are found in a treatise uh, written by a Kabbalist by the name of Temerals, a Polish Kabbalist, in which he comes up with a whole uh, system to see the Sfirot on your hands. If you open up your hands in front of your face, uh, you can basically understand the whole cosmos in the palms of your hands. And it's it's uh, connected to a commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, which is a, uh, an ancient work of Jewish esotericism, which was a kind of Bible to the Kabbalists. So this is, this is not even Luriana Kabbalah, but the commentary was ascribed often to Luria, and it found its way into um, various Lurianic works as if, it, as if it was Luriana Kabbalah. And it's here. Uh, the texts are also quite interesting around it with the author of this uh, Ilan raising large questions, uh, fundamental questions about 
the nature of reality and, and the divine uh, that we don't see in most Ilanot. And finally, a short section treating the lowest, uh, the lower worlds. You may have heard that it's typical for Kabbalists to speak about the four worlds. I didn't have a chance to say much about that tonight, but it's typical in Lurianic Ilanot, especially the compound Ilanot, the great trees, to make some kind of representation of the three lower worlds of Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya, a creation, formation, and action. Uh, the single vintage, uh, single origin Ilanot, and most of what I've shown you uh, up till now, maps Atsilut, the highest world of emanation. But this, uh, this uh, compound Ilanot, like so many, does include, a, a, at least in this case, a very abridged representation of the three lower worlds. Um, and that is where I will end. Late, late, but hopefully not too late. So thank you for your very kind attention. Hey, thank you, uh, Yossi. It was a beautiful and interesting uh, lecture and uh, it's introduction to the Ilanot and we, I don't know, I learned a lot. Good, good. Uh, yes, now thank I can you. appreciate our Ilanot more <laughs> than a, a picture on the wall. Good. Yes, I. most of these things uh, are eye candy for, uh, for folks. Uh, and uh, you can go today to the National Library in Jerusalem and see these images, even in the Gershom Sholem Library, uh, without, without knowing what, what they mean, even if you're a researcher in the Gershom Sholem Library. So can I ask a question to start with questions? What Please. is the connection between Ilanot 1 and Ilanot 2? Are we talking about a revolution or evolution? Great question. Um, uh, I, guess I, I guess if I have to choose, be, I, I think it may be closer to revolution than evolution. But you know, if you ask me tomorrow, I might go with evolution. I would characterize the difference in the following way. Uh, the classical Ilan 1.0 is a map. It's quite, it's quite static. It's the schema of the 10 spherot with information about each sphera in its place. The Lurianic Ilan is dynamic. It's more of a timeline than a map. You scroll through it. Some of these Lurianic Ilanot reach 11 meters, over 30 feet in length. William has in his collection the Ilanot created by a Baghdadi Kabbalist named Shanduch that are over 11 meters in length. And a typical one will be three meters. Your Ilanot are roughly three meters in length, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe closer to four even in one case. That's about twice the length of the magnificent parchment. So they are uh, presenting the unfolding of divinity and uh, in a way that's not the case in the first one. And they're also preparing and, and accustom um, and uh, in, in, they're preparing and making the Kabbalist, the Lurianic Kabbalist, accustomed to a kind of virtual, imag imagined, uh, identified participation in that unfolding of the divine, so that the mission of tikkun, of reparation and enhancement of the divine, can be enacted. So I, I think that that's different enough to say revolution. Um, and, you know, it was uh, Tzemach, perhaps with some inspiration from Vital as well, but Tzemach, who, who I think thought, well, well, this is not just uh, something he made up, but the, the Lurianic teaching spoke about the divine personae as being clusters of the ten spherot. So as they created a kind of fractal image of the divine that was based on the building block of that ten spherot, ten spherot structure that we see in the classical Kabbalah. So that's why you could maybe spin it as 
evolution because they're taking that fundamental structure and fractalizing it and presenting it on a timeline. So it's very different, but you could spin it either way as an evolution or a revolution. Okay, so thank you. So, so we don't have time to many questions. Can I ask AJ to, doc, Dr. AJ to ask the questions? A, sure. Um, Abigail, can you let him un unmute the, AJ? Uh, yes, I unmuted AJ. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, AJ, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much. This was incredible, informative, enlightening, just the image is just ecstatic. I guess a Kabbalist might actually say. Um, I have three related questions. Um, I hope they're not overly burdensome. So first, towards the beginning of your lecture, you had mentioned that the earliest fragment or the earliest map is from like the 15th century but or 14th, but it was um, the genre is significantly earlier. So I'm curious, how do we know that? Do you have do we have literary evidence for Elon Note other than the maps themselves? Mm -hmm. uh, or are we assuming that this is so developed there must have been earlier genres? Question one. My second question, which I think is probably more interesting for me and everyone else is, how are these Elano used? Were they decorative? Merely, or were they actually just ob objects of study? Are they images of pious activity, kind of like the Shriti? So I thought you, you did a really amazing job sort of tackling the, the, the microcosmic details of the Elano, but I'm curious what their reception history was like. Sure. And, and third, um, you mentioned a critical edition. So I'm just curious, how does one create a critical edition of, of images? Sounds like a, a monumental and crazy and wild, but fun task. <laughs> Great. Um, those are also wonderful questions. And I, I, I almost, if, 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 if I didn't know better, I would have sworn I planted you in the audience to ask me those questions. But uh, here are your answers in, in short. First of all, um, in the 14th century, an Italian Kabbalist by the name of Ruben, Ruben Sorfati wrote two works. He, well, he wrote more than two works. He's a famous Kabbalist who also wrote a commentary on uh, the Ma'arechet Elohut and other works. But he wrote a book called Perush Ayiri'ah HaGadola and Perush Ayiri'ah Ktana. Uh, he wrote uh, the languages, the commentary on the great parchment and the commentary on the lesser parchment. Uh, his commentaries have survived in codex manuscripts uh, without being on an Ilan, but there, there are also, there, well, let's just say, there is also a later copy of an Ilan, a classical Ilan that preserves the Tsorfati commentary on the greater parchment. The bottom line is, uh, we know that the genre was happening in the 14th century already um, um, from a number of different angles. Second question is a big one, and uh, you are very right uh, to ask it. How are they used? Um, I think because, as you might expect, the differences between classical and Lurianic Ilanot are substantial. This, there isn't really one answer that covers both, um, but there may be some overlapping uh, in, in answers. Certainly they are uh, useful for students who are trying to get acquainted with this material. Uh, anytime you put uh, texts in a structure, you create a kind of memory palace, a, a mnemonic device um, that can then uh, be useful and, um, and uh, even uh, leveraged for its creative potential by the person who's mastered it, uh, but it's also um, an image that is, is useful in Kabbalistic prayer and intentionality, uh, kavanot. That's true of both classical and uh, Lurianic. Uh, the, I see somebody's, uh, I see little flashes of notification. Someone wrote meditative. Yes, this is uh, what I mean when I say uh, kavanot, the, the prayer intentions, and just the general con contempl contemplative exercise of the Kabbalist it would be facilitated by using these. The Lurianic uh, 
uh, Elanode in particular are um, are both a, a, an un, unrivaled way of familiarizing oneself with the topography and timeline of the of the of the divine realm, but allow for the uh, the kind of, as I said before, the kind of virtual participation of the contemplative in the unfolding of the divine and in the act of tikkun. So, and of course, it's it's also um, it's also something that uh, you know mag you didn't buy a magnificent parchment uh, or commission a magnificent parchment because you wanted to learn Abu Lafia. That probably wasn't the best way to learn the texts of Abu Lafia that are in, in, inscribed in that manuscript. That is an example of a, of a, of an, of a kind of Ilan that was probably in, in most cases used by people who felt like it would be uh, beneficial to have in their possession an image of the cosmos because in the Renaissance, the image and the thing represented were connected through symp sympathies. So if you had a picture of Jerusalem on your wall in the early modern period, or a map of Jerusalem on your wall, it wasn't because you were interested in, in, in firing up Google Maps to know how to get from the central bus station to the old city. It was because the, the image of the map of the place made that place present. So it's um, so in that sense, it's a kind of talismanic object that draws down and makes present that which it represents visually. And finally, I mean, I could I could keep going on that question, but at the very end of the 19th century, there is a phenomenon of the redeployment of, of Lurianic Ilanot as amulets, and there they are, they are used as a, 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 as other amulets would be for protection. And your third question, how do you make a critical edition? Uh, well, uh, we've tried different ways and none of them are out yet, which gives you, an, uh, gives you a sense of the difficulty that you rightly put your finger on. Uh, making printed book crit critical editions of Ila Note, especially Lurianic Ila Note, is, uh, is a, I think a losing battle. Um, and, uh, about uh, two years ago, I secured uh, funding from the Volkswagen Foundation to create a platform for the research and presentation of Ilanot, uh, together with the Digital Humanities Laboratory at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And uh, we are close to putting online a critical edition of the Magnificent Parchment that will allow folks all over the world, free of charge, to explore the magnificent parchment to deep dive into its images and into its texts, which will all be uh, tr fully transcribed in Hebrew and translated into English with commentaries and um, uh, variants and um, in, and 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 uh, did I say commentaries already? So uh, we are now creating a system that will allow you to scroll through Ilanot without uh, having a parchment scroll in front of you, but uh, use your mouse to, to scroll the scrolls. Okay, so thank you, uh, Yossi. I'm not sure that we have uh, enough time for questions, unless you want to continue. I I'm so happy to take a few more. Uh, I can happily go to my, the half hour without stress. Uh, so, what do you think, Abigail? Um, let, maybe, I don't know if, yes, you have time to do this, but maybe it would be nice if we collected all the questions for you. You could do a, a short little follow-up Q&A video for us that we could post to our channel. Um, I'm happy to do that. That would be great. Um, but I did want to give everybody a quick little tour of the scrolls live so that they can feel a little bit more of the experience of what That'd it's like great. to... I, I want to be part of that. All right. So um, anybody that would like to leave, you are welcome to do that. Thank you so much for coming. But if you'd like, I'll take you on a quick five-minute tour of seeing the scrolls as awesome. close to live as you can get during this corona pandemic. All right. Hold tight.
Now, now's, now's a good time to have uh, an Elan uh, amulet because they are uh, always advertised as effective against plagues. I guess before I leave, I should make myself the pinned video so that you can all see me. Okay. Where is it? Here we go. Oh, should I stop sharing my screen then? Uh, no, it's okay. I just made it. Um, I just made it the pinned video. So here we go. We're going on a tour of the library. So, uh, so I will ask you a question by uh, Dolph. Uh, are there any letters I know that include the figure of Jesus within the structure? Jesus? Yes. Um, there, um, there are a lot of Christian Kabbalah uh, visual uh, artifacts that should be compared and have been compared to Ilanot. Um, and they do include such uh, interpolations, if you were, would call them that. Um, the, the, the 17th century Scottish Hebraist, uh, James Hepburn, who was responsible for copying um, a, an, a very old parchment that had been in the library of Egidio de Viterbo, and then passed to the library of Catarina de Medici, and then come to Yitzhak Kozobon in Paris, who couldn't read it and ask this Scottish Hebraist to recreate it for him. That is the Ilan that includes the Ruven Sorfati 14th century commentary. He made a series of prints called the Verga, Au Au Verga Aurea. Hmm, I hope I remember the name correctly, w is a kind of Kabbalistic uh, images centered around the Virgin Mary and the 70 alphabets of the world. And it's a, a, an incredible visual feast that incorporates, uh, in this case, not Jesus, but his mother. So it's, you know, close second, I suppose. Uh, but usually we, it's not so much Jesus, but you sometimes see in Christian Kabbalah that they'll take the Tetragrammaton, yod hei vav hei, and they will add a shin to it to make it into Yoshua. And, and, and then, okay, this is, but this, this is something that uh, is outside the world of the strictly Jewish Kabbalah. Even, I'm willing to put Knorr von Rosenrot in Jewish Kabbalah, but not Jesus. I'm old fashioned. Okay, I see that we see uh, an Ilan of holiness. Okay, Abigail's table. Abigail. Abigail, unmute. Unmute. How do we unmute Abigail? Thank you. Sorry, this oh. this account wasn't set up as a host, so I couldn't unmute myself. Ah, okay. okay. So show me. Ask me. Tell me what you'd like me to unroll for you. Oh no, I mean you've you've done a fine job. You see the the Elan of holiness the is so, on paper, it's about, uh, what did we say it was? About about uh, three, three and a half meters long uh, on paper. It's actually uh, twice the size of the William Gross copy of the same content. It's much roomier. Yes, it is on paper. It's, uh, it's on paper and it's written uh, with room to spare, room to burn, if you compare it to how crowded your parchment is, William, of uh, of the same content. Uh, yours yours would f fit into about a quarter of this one. Um, and I've, 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 yeah, some very interesting little cutout over here. Is this purposely cut out, or was that just an error no, that had to be fixed? No, that's not a cutout. That circle, you mean? No, this like little. Uh, I don't know if you can see that there. It looks like a yud and a mem in a. Oh yeah! Oh, that's not a cutout either. That is one of the oldest Kabbalistic diagrams 
that exists. It's already in 13th century manuscripts. And what you are seeing there uh, in, uh, is the acrostics of the 10 spherot, the first letters of each of the 10 spherot that have been fashioned so as to nest one in the other with Keter being the Kaf that's surrounding them all. And within, you'll see a Chet within the Kaf, the Chokhmah for wisdom and so forth. The Yud you're seeing is Yisod, the ninth Sphira, and there should be a little Mem yes. uh, within it, that's Malchut. So this is a diagram that is intended in its, in its earliest form in the, in the 13th century to ex simply to express the structure of the Sfirot in a manner that is consistent with the, stru the structure of the cosmos, namely concentric circles or, or spheres. Um, in the Sarukian Lurianic reimagining re of this uh, material, these become the primordial spherot. Uh, so this image is used, this, this 800 year old diagram is redeployed to visualize uh, a concept that emerges in the late 17th century in uh, Saruki and Kabbalah. So this, this little diagram though, is it's made of two parts. It was, huh. it's actually, so this paper is two layers thick. And wow. there's like that little image is on the back piece of the paper. You think it? You, oh, really? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you oh, can so see. It's not, a, it's, it's not a restoration thing. It was maybe an attempt to create a, a parchment feeling, a weightiness that the paper would not ordinarily have. Maybe. It's not a conservation. Uh, you can see the pasting from the back of the manuscript. It's very wow. peculiar. Cool. And there also looks like there's some kind of seal over here. That could be an ownership mark from somebody. Hmm. All right, let's take a look at the really beautiful one. Lovely. Which is oh, this is the one that's worth worth buying a ticket to Cincinnati. See in the, to see in the flesh. These things are so hard to appreciate if you're not right on top of them in, the, in real life. Digitization will never... Really? Never do the trick. Uh, 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 unusual Lucky colors, the yeah. greens and reds. It's really getting it's been fragile. It's been handled way too much lately. It's been handled too much lately, you said? <laughs> or over the last 500 years? Number of times over the years, I'm definitely seeing deterioration. Really? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's probably my fault. Where it's been repaired. Abigail, look at this on the side and you can show people. You see where the backing has been applied? Uh -huh. And then if you go further down, it's starting to peel up mm -hmm. from the backing. And I'm getting very nervous about unrolling it. <laughs> I see. Can you can you tell from where it's unrolling? Can you confirm that it is in fact on parchment, not on paper? That. that would seem to me to be a great place to figure out if it was parchment or paper. I've just seen it. It's, it's parchment. Yes. I don't. I don't want to try and rip it and then be no. unsuccessful and then no. know it's parchment. Yeah. parchment. It feels like parchment, given my I've, limited expertise. I mean, I've just seen a. I've just seen a copy in a private collection that was on paper. So that the, there are copies that uh, on parchment and on paper. I was just. Uh, I should think that as the oldest one and one that was executed to such a high aesthetic standard that it would have been committed to parchment rather than paper. Yeah, it, it definitely it's a, has a soft, velvety kind it, of animal skin feel. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to tell because the entire thing has been backed with fabric. I know, I know. The other, uh, the first one you looked at is definitely paper. And <laughs> yeah. the other one is definitely parchment. Let's right. roll that in carefully. Can you see the dragon or any of these other really interesting yeah. details? Sure. This is the top of the zodiac. It's absolutely gorgeous. Unbelievable. This is the first time these manuscripts have seen sun in oh, yeah. decades. You're getting, you're getting this special wow. sunlight tour today. Nice. 
And here um, again are those four figures of the rabbis who went nichnesu lepardes. Exactly. Look, you know, it, it lived for 500 years without white gloves. It'll probably survive a few more. <laughs> Actually, white gloves, I'd probably rip up the fragments. So. <laughs> right. No, I know. Nobody uses them anymore. But I'm just, yeah, I, 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 use, I, I meant it uh, metaphorically. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's roll this guy back up and we'll quickly show you the last scroll, which is wow. in this Incredible. condition. Beautiful. Also, maybe uh, you can see the zodiac has um, around the edge of it. It has degree markings. You see that? That is something that only is on the Cincinnati parchment. Something that looks like an astrolab, but it's for uh, the horse. Basically, it, it's it's useful to people making horoscopes. Uh, there's most of the information that's contained in the zodiac is related to uh, very, very basic kinds of uh, astrological uh, calculation. Even though I, I, I honestly believe that uh, the idea of those degree markings was to convey its, its, the sense of its being a, a, a tool more than, uh, more than a real functionality. Mm. This one's different. And here, this extraordinary uh, Grupa, Isaac of Grupa, early great tree, beginning with Knorf and Rosenrotz, Sarukian frames, and the head of Adam Kadmon and Arich, and then the enrobings of Yaakov Tzemach, beautiful kaleidoscopic fractal enrobings of the spherotic trees. Those of you who are observant Jews or observant non-Jews will notice that the trees have 11, 11 spherot. The Lurianic system used the 11th sphera of Da'at as a part of its interface. So uh, you'll see in, the, in that kaleidoscopic section just beneath what what Abigail is showing us now, uh, 11 spherot in each of those, each of those trees. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite cool. It's quite cool stuff. Um, and this is really a beautifully executed scroll uh, made by this guy, Itzhak Grupa, in this little town in Germany. Uh, I worked with people at the National Library in Israel to try and even figure out these place names. Very unusual. And the man, the only place he shows up is in some, if I remember incorrectly, uh, um, one place his name comes up as, as passing on a teaching of the Vilna Gaon. So is not it also kind of interesting. I don't think many people still have this misimpression that the Lithuanians weren't interested in Kabbalah, like the Litvaks were, um, because they didn't like the Hasidim that they were against Kabbalah. Quite to the contrary, the Vilna Gaon was a great Kabbalist, one of the greatest of his era, and his Kabbalah and the Lith Lithuanian Kabbalah is serious, serious Kabbalah, very appropriate to uh, someone who would make an Ilan like this. So. Fantastic. Though everything you're seeing right now began uh, was in the in the engravings uh, in the 1677 first volume of Kabbalah de Nudata, published in in Sulzbach, Germany. So extraordinary. You guys are three for three on your Elanote collection. And Thank what you a, so much. What, what a treat. I also like. I like that satin sheet that you put them on too. That looks. That's for our, our very, Instagram. Very if anybody is a, a, a fan of Instagram, we put all of our uh, most exciting things that I find in the collection we post there. Uh, if you have Instagram, it's instagram.com slash library. Cool. It's, it's very regal.
Thank you. So uh, then, then I suppose we'll, we'll be signing off. So let me again, thank all of you. Laurel, that's you. I didn't know it was you until just now I read your thing. We've been corresponding for a decade. So yes. nice to see you. Wow. Yes, I'm looking forward to welcoming you to Cincinnati again. Oh, uh, well, I'm going to come back soon. I also miss that good chocolate chip ice cream you guys have. So may it be Sorry, soon. I send any to you. May it be soon. <laughs> but thank you all. Yoram, what a great idea. And Abigail. And uh, this was really a, a, a very special treat. And I appreciate the opportunity and and uh, the and the ongoing collaboration with you. It's uh, vital to my work, and I hope I hope that uh, I can help you in small ways uh, to leverage the potential of these artifacts in your collection. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lucy, and thank you. Thank you for everybody, everyone that joined us today. And good night or good and afternoon. Wait, can I can I get one last shout out? Um, I have to say thank you. There's a, a, there's a Emma Abate, Dr. Emma Abate is, is uh, I see now is a participant and she is a, among other things, a paleographer uh, who I've consulted also now for a number of years. And it was uh, Emma who very uh, unequivocally determined that your parchment was the oldest of them all. And uh, and she always responds quickly to my annoying paleographical queries and makes time for me and even comes to my lectures on Zoom from wherever she is in the world. So thank you, Emma. And thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Abigail and Lowell. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Bye-bye. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone at our next library lecture, Dr. Rahav Rubin on Thursday, November 12th at noon Eastern time. Okay. Okay. Do, 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 do.